unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Hallelujah. Can we sing a song before I start preaching? Hallelujah. Just raise your hand, somebody. Seteleba kashetele potelia. Rosike pandele kesetele. Rosile marande rekoshi kalamaba. Tango ya kuchao Ebi bingi ya vietika Ebancha ya isashula Echiti kwa chiku Umu tango ya kuchao Every Somebody raise your voice. Sing it one more time and so tango. Your voice and speaking at a time. How can I describe the God that's indescribable? How can I express the love that's unexplainable? I'm in a love world. Oh.
myself singing and say, oh,
Something is happening. For anybody who hungers and thirsts. Thank you for your presence, God. God, deal with us. 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 Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, God. Give the Lord a mighty hand clap of praise. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 11, the 11th verse. If you're there, you say amen. Matthew 11 from the 11th verse. Matthew 11. Are we there? Praise the Lord. One, two, three, let's go. It says, Verily, I say unto you, Among them that are born of women. Hallelujah. The Bible says there has not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Among them which are born among. The Bible says there has not been risen one greater than John the Baptist. But the Bible says, notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Who? John the Baptist. Hallelujah. Can you read that again? The Bible says, Verily I say unto you, that among them that are born of what? Women. The Bible says, There has not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Say amen. Amen. So the Bible says, I say unto you, that among them that are born of women, there is none which has risen. Greater than John the Baptist. In other words, if you want to talk about any man born by a woman, none was greater than John the Baptist. Are we together there? Now the Bible says, notwithstanding that he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. In other words, the least among us, the kingdom of heaven, is greater than John the Baptist. It means that even in the kingdom there are rankings. You see, we are equal before God, but we are not equal in ranking before God. Are you with me? Can I say it again? We are equal before God. But we are not equal in ranking before God. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. The spirit world is ranked. And every man must match according to the rank. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. If a man is of course strange to proper, he can frustrate rank. But whether you want it or not, the spirit world is already ranked. You might not respect certain people, but that doesn't disqualify their ranking. Do you understand? You might not honor certain people, but that doesn't disqualify their rankings. You might not see them there, direct translation, but that doesn't disqualify their what? Their rankings. The spirit world is ranked. And the quicker a man understands his rankings in the spirit, are you hearing me? The easier it is to adopt to eternal things. Because the process and life of Christianity is a process of adoptation and mutation. Hallelujah. We adopt and mutate. 
That is why there's an experience of us translated. As we behold like in a mirror the glory of God. The Bible says we are translated. We are translated. We are transformed. We are metamorphosed. To the very image and likeness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That process of metamorphosis. That place where you change. You, 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 you're not the same person that was two years ago. He says and as we behold like in a mirror the glory of God. The Bible says we are changed in the same image. From glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Hallelujah. That means that the person you were last week might not be the person you are now, but it's possible to be the same person you were last week. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord Jesus. Are we together? So, when the Bible says that we, 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 we're beholding like in a mirror, it means that there is a process by which every Christian must know that there are certain things that increase the anointing of God upon your life and increase you in the anointing. When a man has an increase of the anointing upon his life, but he, he himself is not increased in the anointing, that man becomes indifferent to the results he produces. I don't know that you understand what I mean. These are two things. I'll explain. You can increase the anointing of God upon your life and not increase in the anointing. You understand? And you can increase in the anointing upon your life and not increase the anointing upon your life. Forgive the semantics, but it's true. Hallelujah. Let me give you an example. David became king before he sat on the throne. Do you understand? He was king before he sat on the throne. But there was a time spell where Saul stayed on the throne. Because even though the boy's anointing had increased, he had not yet increased in the anointing. He had not carried the maturity to sit in that office. You get my point? But he carried the anointing of the kingly. The Lord had already separated him. Are you hearing me? For that course of kingship. God had, the heavens had already judged that there is something new coming. But he himself was not ready for that. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? But the process the Lord has to take David through to be ready to sit on that throne is dependent on how he adopted in the principles of increasing in the anointing. There are many people who have anointing to do too much, but they don't have the ability individually that is equal to the anointing of the task that is laid before them. I don't know that you understand what I mean. Some of you will understand in future. <laughs> Say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Now, let's go back to the issue. Now, the Bible speaks of the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now, next verse. The next verse says, And from the days, read with me, of John the Baptist, until now, he says, The kingdom of heaven suffereth, and the violent take it. Read it again. And from the days of John the Baptist, the Bible says, The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Read it again. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now let me start teaching. I'm starting. In Corinthians 11.3, he says that I fear least by any means the serpent as the serpent beguiled Eve. Huh? The Bible says through his subtlety. He says, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity which is in Christ. Paul's fear is that there is a way the serpent beguiled Eve because of his subtlety, because of his craftiness and intelligence. And the Bible says he fears that their minds, or the minds of the people to which he was speaking, to which were the Gentiles, his fear was they, they might be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Listen, members. People are corrupted from the simplicity. Do you understand? People are corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The primary line of corruption in the body of Christ 
is when we complicate what ought to be simple because we're in Christ. Am I making sense? You see, many people, for so long we've been teaching men to be, or people to understand the relationship, but the relationship they carry is the with Christ thing. Do you understand? And we have preached truth that is, might be relevant to the minds of men who are yet unstable. But that very truth is not relevant to the present truth. That's right. You get where I'm coming from. You understand what Peter means when he speaks about the present truth. He speaks to the church and calls to remembrance of those things and he tells them that because you know them and you're establishing the present truth, there are certain things that are, it's like, I'll give an example. I can preach a sermon and say, except the Lord go with me, I shall not go. Because I'm quoting who? Moses. That is truth, but it's not present truth. Because Jesus does not move with Christians. Jesus moves in Christians. The Bible says, Great is the mystery which was hid from the ages past and now revealed. Which is Christ with you? No. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Now, the Bible says you've been sealed with him for eternal redemption. The mystery that the world never knew, even in the time of Moses, was not revealed. That God would bodily dwell inside the human, man, a human being. And during that time, it was okay for a man to say, unless the Lord go with me, are you hearing me? I will not go. But now in the truth that we established, there is no more negotiation of the Lord going with us. He, he's already, in fact, let me explain this. Going with you means you go and he goes alone. The Lord has no choice. There was a song we used to sing. We used to sing. Where you go, God, I will go. You understand? <laughs> Listen, you have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible. And because you're born of the incorruptible seed, which is the word of God, it lives in you and abides forever. There's Christ in you. Are you hearing me? Which is the hope of glory for men to be revealed to? You understand? He's no longer thinking of a place where he will go and then you follow. You see, before you became born again, <laughs> okay, somebody will say, but Paul says, follow me even as I follow. Okay, the word there is imitations. You get it? The root word there is imitations. And imitations are spiritual actions. Are you hearing me? Not physical movements spiritually. I don't know whether some of you understand. It's okay to say we are followers of Christ if the mind of the Spirit is that we are imitators of the man. But he now dwells in the inside of us. I cannot go to Kamoch and God is not there. You, you get where I'm coming from. I cannot go to Wandega and God is not there. Why? Because he is in me now. Are you hearing me? He's in me now. He, he doesn't follow me. I don't follow him. He's in me. I in them. That the world may know. Do you understand? Somebody say, Jesus walks in me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Not with me, in me. He's in me. Praise the Lord. So as I'm moving here, the guy has also shifted. As I go back, he has also shifted. When you sit in a taxi, he's seated in you. Are you hearing me? Now, that was an example, but back to the point. He said that I fear this by any means. As the serpent beguiled it through the subtlety, his subtlety. He says that your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity which is in Christ. You cannot understand that if you have not understood any in Christ truths. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? And that is why as a Christian, primarily, the moment you start to walk with God, look for every scripture in the Bible that speaks of the in Christ, in Christ. Underline it. Because those are things that ought to be meditated upon, that your profiting may be evident among all. Are you with me? Now, let's go a bit deeper here. So, when you speak about the simplicity, the Greek word there for simplicity is haplotes. Haplotes is translated as the openness, the easiness. 
the openness of the gospel. Are you hearing me? Now some people think that when they read the word simplicity there, they think it's surface, scratching surface. I don't know that you get the difference. The word there for simplicity is simply the openness. The place in the gospel where there is no hypocrisy or pretense. Do you understand? In the essence, if you realize the scriptures in context, you realize that what makes the serpent subtle is a place where he pretends to be what he's not and carries a line of hypocrisy to make a man fall. Are you with me? Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? Now, the essence of the simplicity which is in Christ is that God, actually, God doesn't trip you in the spirit, according to the scriptures. God is not hypocritical. He doesn't have a line of pretense. The gospel is open. That's what the Bible calls simplicity. It's open for any man to access by the spirit of revelation. But that kind of simplicity is not the simplicity that some people think it is. Because simplicity, some people think simplicity means that the gospel is simple. (laughs) Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? Until you realize by the scriptures that God actually open rebukes He openly rebukes sinful people. You understand? That's what he says in Proverbs 122. He says, for how long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scornings and fools hate knowledge. There are people who just love simple. They they, they want to scratch surface. Everything. You understand? Somebody just gets mad. Why? I didn't understand what you're saying. Why don't you make it simple? (laughs) Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? Someone one time sat me down and put me in a lecture and said, Apostle Grace, you speak very complicated things. Why don't you make them a bit more simple? How can I simplify? Why does it also reveal to me the way it is? <laughs> Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? The word there is pethe. Now, pethe there, simplicity, is naivety. Many people are naive to the things of death in God. Do you understand? Everything to them is black and white. Yet the gospel and the wisdom of God like Proverbs tells you in the earlier verses, is to give subtlety to them which are simple. That's the essence of the wisdom of God. Every time the word of God comes, it comes to separate you from people who understand the Bible simply. Do you understand? That's why it says to give. Let's begin from verse 2, I think. Uh He speaks of to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of the understanding. And he says to receive instruction of wisdom, justice and judgment and equity. To give subtlety to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. God intends that he gives you a certain subtlety in the word. The word there for subtlety per se is translated as prudence. Because the essence of prudence shifts you from knowing the ways of the spirit to the way of God. That is why the Bible says that the wisdom of the prudent is to know the way of the Lord. There's a difference between knowing the ways and the way of God. Are you hearing me? The Bible says that the wisdom of a prudent man, same word there, subtle, per se, the wisdom of a prudent man is to understand his way and the folly of fools is deceit. In other words, Even though God has ways. You see, the Bible says Moses understood the ways of God. That's wonderful. But it's another thing to know the way of God. The ways of God is how he acts. The way of God is the thinking pattern before he acts. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. The ways of God is how he acts. Moses knew how God gets pissed off. Moses knew if God was going to smile. Moses knew if God was about to move. Moses knew if God was about to heal. Moses knew if God was about to deliver. Moses knew if God was about to speak. Those are ways. But the wisdom of the prudent, the Bible says, is to know the way. Are you hearing me? In other words, it goes in the depth of just knowing how God does his things. But why he does them. When you know why God does those things, you realize that you're introduced to a deeper line of relationship with God because you start to relate with Him entirely on the basis of why He does certain things before they are questioned on why He does them or how He does them. 
Do you know that the biggest fight, and I've seen with men which are indifferent, with the mind of the Spirit, is explaining why God does certain things. And because they can't have literal explanations of why God does certain things, but they know the house of those things, it's easy for them to carry human ideas and doctrines, even as the doctrines of Christ, to seek an explanation of why he did certain things, because that's the only way they can survive before men explaining the house. Or am I complicating it? I'll give you an example. You just read Matthew 11, 12. If the Bible says that from the days of John the Baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force, think with me. Think with me. If you are studying the ways of God only, you might miss out on his way. And if you miss out on his way, you might miss out on the central line of that scripture. Many people who use that scripture actually use it from a legalistic perspective of works. Are we disqualifying works? Works have their part. Only if they have a precedence of faith. Faith without works. You understand? And faith with works. We're not talking about the works that come before the faith. No. We're talking about the works that follow the faith. Are you with me? But in this instance here, many people read that scripture legalistically. Okay, let's think with you, if you're thinking legalistically. If the Bible says from the days of John the Baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force, it would mean that the only way to get born again is to go into the kingdom by force. You have to apply a certain power and strength. Isn't it? So then, why is it that the Bible says that the publicans and prostitutes go into the kingdom before the Pharisees? Who used too much force? No, help me. Circumcised on the eighth day. A Hebrew of Hebrews. Of the stock of Benjamin. Of the tribe of Israel. Be, tribe of Benjamin. Stock of Israel. You understand? Concerning zeal. Persecuting the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law. Blameless. But with all of those things, you realize Paul could not access the kingdom. Actually, many people ask themselves, what is the kingdom? Actually, the Greek and Hebrew translation for the word kingdom is realm, the realm of God. If you say that the kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violent take it by force, it means for us to take the kingdom, to enter into the kingdom of God, we have to use a lot of force. So, what is then the essence of predestination? Before you are formed in your mother's womb. What's the essence of me being formed in mother's, my mother's womb? Predestinated. The Bible says, to whom he predestinated, he also what? Hey, 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 read it. To whom he predestinated, he also what? Called. And to whom he called, he also what? And to whom he justified, he also what? Glorified. Give me the amplified of the same. Romans 8, 30. Read it. Uh huh. Read. One, two, three, let's go. Uh huh. He also what? Called. And those whom he called, he also what? Bracket. Acquitted. Made whatever said. Made righteous. Putting them into right standing with himself. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Raising them to a heavenly dignity and condition or state of being. So, if I am predestinated, where is my forceful engagement to enter into the kingdom? What does Luke 12, uh, 32 say? Luke 12, 32. What does it say? Uh-huh. Read. Uh-huh. What is your father's good place? He's happy. Don't force it. He's happy to give you the kingdom. What does the message version say? Read the message. Uh-huh. 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 You're my dearest friend. The father. He wants. So, if you're saying the violent take a thing by force, yet the father wants us, it means that there is a force bigger than the wanting of the father. Come on. And the gates of hell. The only difference is that this particular church is the one who built it. The other ones were built by men. 
He says, on this rock shall I build my church. Mine. And he says, that one, the one I built, the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. They cannot be a place where my own suffers to get into what I, Jehovah God, pleasures for them to go into. Come on. Be of cheer, little flock. For it is the good pleasure of God to give you the kingdom. He's there. He's ready to get you. But he says, for them which come, they say, he speaks of the faith of a child. See how children come. They simply, they don't use force in it. You get it? And then you realize that when God is talking about the kingdom, he speaks of a place where people adopt it the way children enter into it. How do children act? They simplify everything. That day, after a little boy who is about three, ask him, can you drive? He says, <laughs> Yeah, he can. What makes him think he can drive? Because when he sees this, he thinks it's easy. Hallelujah. Praise God. So when the Bible speaks of the violent taking it by force, you might miss it out and become too legal. <laughs> and die praying to receive what you have. Instead of a prayer that walks in what you already have. Do you know how much time we wasted? <laughs> Do you think, listen, listen. When the Bible says we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing, it means there is nothing you're going to do to bless you. Now, you cannot say I won't let you go until you bless me. God is looking and saying, look at this guy. He's asking me to bless him. No, some of us, I wish you were raised in where, where were some of us who were raised. Oh my God. There was a night we held God As I think about, very young in, in church, during those times, this guy knows it was in Kawempe. <laughs> oh my God, we tried to hold God. What? <laughs> Do you understand? Now, if the Bible says you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, there is a man right now praying to receive blessing. There is a man right now travailing in the blessing. <laughs> Those men are going to produce two different results. Why? Because one is praying with the understanding, but not in the understanding. The other one is praying in the understanding and with the understanding. There's a difference. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? You can pray with understanding, okay? He says, I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding. I also see... With the spirit, and I will sing with the understanding. Praise the Lord. You see, you can have understanding. It's like the songs we sing. Eh? You can sing, Jesus, that's with, under with understanding. Loves me, this no, That's with understanding. Father, Father, tell me so. Nenga, you don't even know what you're singing. <laughs> but you're with understanding. With understanding is, you know the words. In the understanding is you have carried the experience. That when you say God loves me, eh, you don't say it from a perspective of let me convince myself, oh, the, the rhyme is good. No. He has dealt with you to a point where your, his love just breaks you. And when you stand on the pulpit and say, Jesus loves me, you know what? It's like people can simply say, God is faithful. You With an understanding. But not in the understanding of his faithfulness. Listen, the testations of our faith prove the faithfulness of God. Some of us, some, some people here can say, me, if I was not born again, I, uh, I would be very lost. No, some of us, if we were not born again, would be dead. There's a difference. So, when we define faithfulness... We're not talking about coffee and tea, ice cream and candy. We're talking about some of us can't go where we came from. Because there was a big demand on our lives. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? Me, I can't backslide. There are people who can backslide. Me, I can't. I don't have that offer. Eh? There's someone who can say, ah, sometimes I backslide, sometimes I'm ulukuom. <laughs> yeah, I can't. 
can't. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? Because I know how he dealt with me. I know. You see, if you don't understand responsibility according to the demand on your life, there are certain things you can afford to do. Me, I can't backslide. It's not pride. Uh uh-uh. uh. I can't. You get it? It's. I wish you understand. Me, I can't. Because the, the price to backsliding right now. It's, it's, you'll never understand. Some of you will never understand. Why? Because you came because you don't have a job. This year God is going to give you a job. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now let's go back to the place here. So, it's the same thing when we're approaching God. We never used to approach God in spirit and in truth. The approach Christians have is not in the understanding of the divine truth arrayed for them to give them access to God. No. Many people are in the indifference of what they really don't understand pertaining the life of the spirit. Same thing. The violent take it by force. A guy says, okay, if God has to touch me, I have to pray for 35 hours. You understand? Yet some of us pray for 35 hours because he touched us. You get the difference? <laughs> I wish you get me. When the man went on the cross and said it is finished. Oh, he said it was finished. But do you know why some of you even find it hard to pray? It's because you're praying in reverse form. You're... If you've give, been given everything that pertains to life and godliness, and your faith is in there, do you realize the first thing that leaves you? Anxiety. Anxiety leaves you in any line of prayer and fear. You don't pray in fear, you don't pray in anxiety. Do you know how many people here? Your father has cancer. Oh God. Rasakatala. The Bible says you receive not the spirit of bondage again to fear. So, what led her to prayer? Daddy has cancer. Masakaya. Masakaya. I'll seek your face until you heal him. Masakaya. Masakaya. And if he's born again, it's even worse. Because the Bible says that he that knew no sin became sin, that you being dead unto sins might live unto righteousness, and by whose stripes you were healed. So he start to claim the healing of a man which was already healed in the scriptures. You waste time. Simplicity. Which is in Christ. Am I making some sense? Eh? If you've been blessed with every majesty, he says, be anxious about nothing. Nothing. He says, but with all what? Prayer and supplication. Uh huh. With thanksgiving, let your request. He didn't say, with request, thanksgive. No. He says, with thanksgiving, make your request. Thank you, Lord, for my car before I have it. Thank you, Lord, for my house before I have it. Thank you, Lord, for my job before I have it. Man, that prayer, you can't stop. Because for me, every time I stand in there, in the line of the finished work of Christ and the blessing that I carry, I start to look at Paul. He says, whether it be Apollos, that means every revelation in Apollos. Whether it be Paul, that means every revelation. Even if nothing was added. Listen. Paul, let me help you understand this. Paul laid down the foundation of the gospel, literally, by revelation. He tells you this gospel was not taught to me by any man, but even it was revealed unto me by the revelation of Jesus Christ. That means the Christ used to get into this guy and function, not in the Gnosco experiences. It's not progressive, no. It's a big no. The advanced knowledge, which is complete in a man, because of the knowledge of Jehovah God who is in him, in whom I hid all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He carries that guy in the inside. So, the line of revelation is a line of faith. Do you understand? It's a line of faith. It's a place I don't know because I read. I know because I believe. You see, he's the word. He dwells in you. 
He's the one which became flesh. And dwelt. listen, Paul did not have New Testament teachings to read from to write to Colossae and Philippi and Corinth. No. These were the liberties of a man in the spirit realm, walking with God every day and speaking the things. In fact, that's why when he's instructing his son, he tells him, deeper than just the places of imitations, he tells him, speak the things which become. Sound. They become. Sound doctor. They become. They he even gets to a point where he can say, this I speak not by permission. You get it? You know, the heavens, the heavens have not commanded me to say this. But because of the liberties of the spirit that I carry, I have been enriched in love, in all knowledge and judgment to examine the things most excellent. And I can't have offense. And in that thing he says, now let me talk about marriage. Not because I'm married, but because I know the great mystery which the Christ carried with the church. And Paul starts teaching. Now, there are, there are liberties in the spirit, okay, that can never seek any justifications of men. And indeed, could seem questionable to men which have not walked certain places. Peter wakes up in the morning and he says, one day Jesus went to the souls. Who, who told Peter? Was Peter there? He says, he went to the souls. Those spirits that were lost in the days of Noah. And the Bible says, and he preached unto those spirits in prison. But when Peter says it, you don't question his authority. But first, wait a minute. Who told Peter? Is it written in the Old Testament? Where did Peter see it? Come on. Come on. That is why, when you understand the place of love, eh? Some people think love is just loving your neighbor and sharing cake with them. Listen, in Corinthians 13 verse 8, let me introduce you to a certain place. In Corinthians 13 verse 8, he speaks of a place where charity, give me that amplified. He says, love never fails and it never what? Fades out and becomes obsolete or becomes or comes to an end. He says, as for prophecy, listen to that dispensation. The gift of interpretation of the divine will and purpose. He says, it will be fulfilled and it will pass away. Because whatever is fulfilled passes away. We've prophesied, things came to pass and it passed away. You get it? And listen to this. He also says, as for tongues, they will also be destroyed and ceased. The tongues you probably spoke in 2012 are not the tongues you're speaking now. They've changed like your signature. Do you understand? He says, as for knowledge, now this killed me. He says, as for knowledge, it will pass away. It will lose its value and be superseded by truth. Now listen to that. That is why when God is talking about relationship with you, he's talking of a love that passes all knowledge. He, God wants to relate with you deeper than anything a man could ever define as knowledge. There is a place above knowledge. There is a place above what you want to call I know. You see, one time I was, you know, I was carried, okay, in the spirit. I hate talking these things because some people will make experiences standards, yet they are not supposed to be. But let me share just for the purpose of, to give understanding. And I was taken to the place of what men call knowledge. That is whatever progresses by reason of what a man adopts, either through reading or listening or whatever. Huh? And I saw there was an end to it. Everything a man could ever define in knowledge, there was an end to it. Now, when the Bible speaks of knowledge puffing up, eh, you ask yourself, how can a man be puffed up in what has an end? Do you understand? How can a man be puffed up in what has an end? I saw the end of knowledge. Okay? And to the end of that knowledge, I saw the life of the heavenly creatures 
which live the life of in Christ versus the heavenly creatures which never had an experience of the in Christ. Look at the angelics. God has never dwelt in an angel. Do you understand? So no angel understands God. They are with God, but they don't. Even Peter says, of which salvation the prophets of old preached. They searched out diligently. The Bible says, which prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. And he says, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. When he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that follows after. And he says, and to whom it was revealed that not unto them and to us they did minister these things. Listen, which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel and to you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Which things the Bible says even angels desire to look into. In other words, even angels have a certain hunger to look into certain things. These things are not in heaven. No. No. Listen. These things are in the human spirit in whom God dwells. Angels want to understand how do you, God, get into a small man like this and start to work. Now, angels start to inquire into these things. What is salvation? What is grace? Angels don't understand grace. Angels don't understand salvation. They inquire every day. They're like students learning. Now, some people think that because the angelics always worship God every day, they think that these angels understand God. Listen, that's why they are, they are servants. They are ministers to the earth. Because you, there's something in you they need. That's why you can't die when you know. I said you can't die when you know. That's why the Bible says they are preserved by knowledge. Knowledge preserves us. Listen, you can't die when you know too much. You can't. The Bible says that the eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge. You know why people die sometimes? They die because they don't know. You have to get to a point where heavens, where it will take too much to get you off the earth because of what you know. Unless it's your time to say, you know what, I'm out. But if you're not yet out, are you hearing me? I refuse that you die early in the name of Jesus. I said I refuse that you die early in the name of Jesus. Tell your neighbor, I know too much to die. Tell him, I know too much to die. Tell him, I know too much to die. Now, I want to wrap this up. So I realized, listen, the angelics, they don't know. So they come to search out and say, what is in this man? What is in this man? Even the prophets, which prophesied? Hezekiah, Ezekiel. All of these guys, they were prophesying, but they didn't understand what is in you. They did. Now, the Bible says simply, things I hear people quote cheaply, like they are cheap, yet they are very rich. I has not seen. Ear has not heard. Come on. If you've read about Reinhard Bonke, we're talking about something you've never seen in Reinhard Bonke. If you've read about Benny Hinn, we're talking about something you've never read in Benny Hinn. If you've read about Deo Barabi Kubo, we're talking about something that was never in Deo Barabi Kubo. I, he said, has not seen. Ear has not heard. It has not entered the hearts of men. People, a human heart cannot comprehend it. What the Lord has prepared. The amplification. Amplify it and see. Amplify it. Amplify it. Amplify it. He says, yet to us, listen. Uh-uh. Before. Uh, uh, uh. But on the contrary, listen. As the scriptures say, read. What eye has not seen, read. Ear has not heard and has not entered into the heart of man. All that God has prepared. Read. Made and kept. Has kept ready stuff that for them who love him, not for those he loves, for them who love him. The Bible says he has prepared 
who hold him in affliction and trembling and promptly obey him and gratefully recognizing the benefits he has bestowed. Recognizing the benefits. Recognizing the benefits. Recognizing the benefits. I've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. That, that's a recognition of the benefit. There is something that is stored up for me. It's made ready. No eye has seen it. How then can a man carry the connotations of things I've not seen, had anywhere, I have not entered the hearts of a man in the history of, of the world and the church. But yet God is revealing those things to a man somewhere in Africa. He doesn't know anyone. That's why when Paul is speaking about revelation, he gets to places where no words which no human language could put. He says, I, I know the man who has taken up. And he says, this man, whether in the body, I don't know, but he says, I was caught up into paradise. The Amplified says, and he had utterances beyond the power of a man to put in two words. Which man is not permitted to utter? In other words, if there's any utterance for that man, you have not to be man. I don't know whether you're talking. See, there are things we can't preach as men. Because they can't enter the human heart. They are too deep. For the human heart, you would need a certain language to explain. Even tongues can't. Listen to that line of ministry. Listen, listen. He says, these things, he had utterances beyond the power of man. To put in two words. Which man is not permitted? In other words, there are things the heavenlies have denied access to any man who stays man and can even if you pray and fast a thousand days, you can't access these things. That's why God, listen, the Bible calls them, I want to show you things which are unsearchable. There are things in the spirit you can never search. There are things you can't search in the spirit. You can't search them. You can only love yourself in them. You can only love God. You can only love God in, into them. Have I met sins? You can only love God into them. You, you, you can't pray. You can't fast for them. You, can't, you can only love God into them. Oh. How great the riches of God. How unsearchable. Now, when I set my mind to understand the end of what men call knowledge, I understood why the church in Corinth could be equipped in all knowledge, all utterance. They come short in no gift. But Paul wants to have a conversation with them in chapter 3. And he can't talk with them. No, read chapter 1. He says, for you are what? In everything you are enriched by him. In all utterance, listen. In all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So that you come behind in no gift. Waiting for the coming of our Lord. They were ready. They have the gifts. They have knowledge. They have revelation. The utterances are there. And Paul testifies of them. Then he comes in chapter 3 and wants to have a conversation with them. And he says, I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. Because there was a conversation that it couldn't be put in words. I wonder how we're going to be talking in heaven. I just wonder. Spirits of just made made perfect. I wonder some people think their conversations are like the way we're talking. Oh, so did you go to this? Oh, no, I didn't go. It's because my wife... No, listen. 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 The conversations of heaven are different. That is why when a man says, I've been to heaven, sometimes I want to know which heaven. You don't get it. You see, there's a dimension where God takes you to hell and then takes you back. And then takes you to heaven, and then you see angels, and then takes you back. And then you see a glassy sea. That's okay. But there's a place God can take you. And you come back in your body. And you can't identify your arm from the leg. Listen, let me say it again. It's okay to be taken to heaven. And then you see. And then you're taken to heaven. And then you see. And then you say, I saw cherubim. I saw seraphim. I've had these experiences. 
where you go to heavenlies and then you see, wow, the first there was a time I was just next to a lake and then literally heaven was open. I could see seraphim. I knew there was seraphim. That's the, the thing about the heavenly visitation. You can tell who is who. You can see seraphim. I could see the glory of God. I could see the seat of the master. I could see the light that flooded. I knew it was God. I knew it. It was clear as day. But then there was a certain place I went and I came back and I couldn't talk for three days. God they asking me what's wrong. I could just say, la ba ba le ba ba la la ba ba la me seke le la ba 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 la he le he o le ba. And you still feel they don't understand it. You see, God deals with every man according to their level of faith. Try to understand. If God knows your spirit can't contain certain things, he can't let you there. I know that for a fact. That is why certain people die. Some people can even run mad in the middle of prayer. A guy just runs mad. Because he's trying to access stuff he's not able to, to, to handle. The guy fasted for 20 days. The next thing you know, he said, pink, purple. You understand? Am I making sense? And I've realized that the quickest way to the deepest dimensions of love, sorry, of God, is through the lines of love. When a man understands the love of God, that is why he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, you might what? Be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, what is the length, engineers, depth, Engineers, depth. You understand dimensions here? And height. Uh-huh. And to know the love of Christ. Give me the amplified. Which one? That you may really come to know practically through experience for yourself. You see that? Through experience for yourself. Where salvation becomes an experience. It's not Omar Ekal in the poster. It's not just an experience. A passive abandonment of sitting in a chair and then you worship God and then you go back home and then you get a promotion. No. He says that through experience for yourself, you know the love of Christ, which surpasses mere knowledge without experience. You understand? That you may know, that you may be filled through all your being and to all the fullness of God, that you may have, listen, the richest measure of the divine presence to become a body holy and flooded with God himself. When I read those scriptures, I start praying. It means a man can contain the fullest measure of God, the riches. Hey, 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 hey. The fullness of He said that you may have the richest, richest, richest measure of the divine presence. You know, it's possible for a man to have the richest measure of the presence of God and become a body, listen, wholly filled and flooded with God himself. You can't tell that man that he can't walk on water. You can't tell that man that he can't pass through walls. You can't tell that man that he cannot go to Manila right now. Milano or Canada right now if he wants you can't tell that man that if he wants to preach to a lost soul in Brisbane right now he can't be there because that man carries the freedom which comes because of the kingdom how then are we going to raise a generation now think with me when I went to the end of knowledge I, I saw this thing called the love of the father you understand? And when I get there, I realize that his primary interest was for me to understand myself in who he was. Do, do, do you understand who he is, in who he is? To, for me to know how I fit into him, when you're in that dimension, knowledge is lower. Simply to know is lower. Truth is the standard. 
Truth is whether you know it or you don't. See, you can adopt by the knowledge that comes to you to know truth. But there's a place where even if you didn't know, you are. And that is why he calls it the perfection of love. Because he is love. And this is love made perfect. That we might have confidence on that day. For as he is, so are we in this world. He didn't say as he was. No. He didn't say as he was. He said as he is. He didn't say as he was. No. He didn't say as he walked Nazareth and Jerusalem and Gethsemane. No. He said as he is, so are we. How is Jesus now? And he says that when a man gets to the end of that line of perfection, as Jesus right now is, so you become. So you become. Now, if it is possible for a man to carry the richest measure of the presence of God, and a man's body is wholly flooded with God himself, how do you think that man will live his daily life? Think for a moment. I have not seen. Ear has not heard. It has not entered the hearts of men. People can't imagine a body wholly flooded with God. That nothing about that man defines him anymore. He's dead yet he lives. Yet not him but Christ lives. And the life he lives now is by the faith, the Bible says, of the Son. Not in the Son. Of the Son. Not in the Son. Of the Son. That means the Son himself is inside you, functioning. They bring a blind eye. It's not, have, it's not your faith in God. No, it's Him having faith in you. That's why now the Bible says that love believes all things. It believes in all things. It believes all things. That love, this God wants to get to a point where He's so in you that when they bring a blind eye, you don't believe God for healing. No. Listen, you don't even have a part of believing anymore. Because he's in you. You're dead. You, your part of believing is dead. Mark Holland. That is why he now tells the man, if you have the God kind of faith. He didn't tell him if you have faith in God. No. He says, if you have the God kind. God wants to take the church where we have his kind of faith. It's inside you. You don't have faith in God. No. You have his kind of faith in you. It's inside. That when you get to a dead man, you don't even need to quote scripture and remind God. You told us that if we lay hands on the sick. No. Some people even claim scriptures that are not for New Testament creatures. You shall trample on snakes and scorpions. He was talking to disciples which were not born again. The life of a believer is deeper than trampling in a snake and a scorpion. Come on. That's a lower rank. That is why when, when, when the serpent bites Paul, he just does like this. It's not a miracle. He does his own thing. And the Bible says they wait for him to die. Because Paul looked at that as a lower life. Listen, he told him, you shall, you, you shall step on snakes and scorpions. The guy is telling, he has not yet died and resurrected. Salvation is not yet come. They are not new creation. It is provisional power. There is a difference between dunamis and exosia. They are functioning under exosia, but snakes can't kill them. How much more he which received dunamis? The very power of God is inside me. Snakes biting is not even a miracle. No. He just bites you. Say, eh. Even a man which was not born again. He, he. And then that's when I realized that a man with dunamis can pronounce exosia on a man. Who is not born again. And he tells him a snake, even if it bites you, you won't die. Did you understand what I'm saying? And a man, a snake bites him. And he says, like the man of God said, the snake bit me. That doesn't mean that that man is born of God. This is deeper. Snakes can't even bite God. Christ in you. Christ in you. Now, I want to finish. When I saw this love, I 
understood the way of the Lord. I understood the way of the Lord. I knew ways, but I didn't know the way. The love of God is His way. The love of God is His way. His love is His way. Now, the end of Jehovah God, listen, I found myself weeping bitterly. But the tears that I was carrying in my soul was the end of what I thought could not end. When I saw knowledge fading away before my very own eyes, I wept. Because the very spirit of revelation was the very substance of God's redemptive power. When a man sees redemptive power fed, he weeps. But hardly had I known that he wanted to tell us that beyond that, it's necessary. But beyond that, there's a place where a man needeth not redemption. And that if, if that man is perfectly in love. Because he becomes as I am. I don't need redemption. The Christ doesn't need to be redeemed. I saw days where men are going to live many years without a, a scar on their body, without an operation, without a drug in their stomach. And people are going to ask them, how come you don't fall sick? And they're going to say, I am at the end of this perfection of love. For as he is, so I am in his world. I saw a generation. Listen, we are going to enter into a life of the miraculous. We are already doing miracles, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a place where a hundred men will come sick. And a hundred men, all of them will go back here. And no man is going to go back sick. No man. I saw that day. I saw days where we will call Pastor Noah and tell him, can we meet in Brisbane now? And the man of God will tell me what time? 11 p.m. And you tell your wife, I have to be in Brisbane by 11. Can you put supper on the table? You eat supper at 10.30. Dress up. And 11 you're in Brisbane. You cannot understand me. Those are the things that cause me to pray. I no longer pray for biscuits and candy. No. When I think of these things, how can a man have the richest measure of the presence of God and he's limited by an airport and a terminal? He will love men enough to send us there without visas. Okay, if you understand it that way, let me slate it that way. He will love men enough to make us appear before them in the flesh to ask them understandest thou what thou readest? How can I know except if a man explain me? But God loves him enough that my appearing and disappearance is simply because he has to reach out to the man. Listen, the limitations to the gospel are ca- literally coming to an end. When it's money, men are going to enter their bathtubs and say, how much money do you need for the crusade? And a man says $50,000. And he says, if he spoke to a fish, as he is, so I am, go into my bathroom, get $50,000, and there is no way that man won't fight $50,000. Somebody help me, I have not seen. That's why I realize the lines of violence actually in Matthew eleven twelve is the distinct violence the Lord has called for every man. Faith. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I pity the man who doesn't read the word 
but thinks that they can fast themselves there. No. Fast, pray, and read. So I realized that the true line of grasping this thing, it is a place seizing. They take it by force. The violent take it by force. The true lines of violence is actually our application to faith. We fight the good fight of faith. Let me tell you, we are going to seem indifferent when we tell men that these things are possible. But oh Lord, I dream for a day. When our sons and daughters will look at us and say our fathers looked stupid in a generation X. But now we look at them as generals. We look at them who knew exactly what they were saying. Say, there were things back in the earth that were like ideas in sci-fi movies, but now have become reality. The first time Martin Cooper walked on the streets with a wireless phone, everybody could not believe that he was talking to a man thousands of miles away. But it happened before in a sci-fi movie. Listen, the gospel is not sci-fi. No, the gospel is power. Holy Spirit, help me. Somebody raise your voice and speak to Jesus. Speaking other tongues. In the secret, in the quiet place. Still next, he was there in the secret, in the quiet hour. I went only for you. I don't want to know. Come on, make a prayer to God. Still
impartation. I see an impartation. Holy Spirit, where are your people? I see an impartation. Holy Ghost! Holy Ghost! can search out. I've seen prophets, about 13 of them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I saw God speaking to you things. The place of our future. The place of our future is literally deeper than just the Obaka. Whether it's Apollos or Paul. God causes you to hear. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Venero, make manifest.